Cool. This is a overview of Linux. It's actually going to be three lessons. Um, the first one is going to be processes, which is this one. The next one that I want to discuss is permissions. And the one after that is going to be scripting. And I think with those, and maybe also, um, I can also go into packages. Packages, how Linux's package system works. And then, yeah, I think from there you will have a fairly good idea about what Linux is about, how it works, the kernel, etc. etc. Okay, cool. But what this is all about is processes. Now, process is basically an app. It's a collection of, it's basically an environment, almost like a sandbox, where <coughs> process can allocate memory, you can start threads, you can variables, everything in one space. The process can't access another process memory or variables or threads or whatever. You can't execute that one's code. So it's basically an instance of code that can actually execute. That's the idea of a process. Now, inside the process, there's environment variables. Um, that's just a lot of variables that's specific to this process. It's not variables when you, in Java, you can have a variable x, and you can say it's a long and initialize a value, and you can use it, and it's got a certain scope. It's not that. This is process variables, environment variables. I think it can only take strings, as far as I know, um, and there's no other type. It's a string. That's it. Some of them I think might be ints, but I haven't actually heard of that. I think you basically just do arithmetic operations on strings, and automatically does int conversion, if you call it that. And in each process, it also belongs to a user. So when you start a process, it must be started by a user. Or um, a user can, let's say root, can start a process as another user. So that user basically determines the permission that this process has. Um, when you go into Android, you start studying Android, you'll see that a lot of them I'm going to explain here actually also starts working. For instance, Android, each, each process or each app has got its own user. So that user can only also, has only got permissions to his files. You can't access another user's files. And obviously that user can't access your files. And if you want to share them, you can say what the other user is allowed to do. Um, each process also has an ID, which is an uh, integer value. I think it might actually be a short value, because I think it goes to 32,000 and starts back at zero again. No, that's short. Yeah. So, this is an ID that's usually used to manage processes. So, if you want to kill a process, you use the ID to kill it. If you do the top command or the PS command, you'll get a list of processes and it will actually tell you what's the process ID, what's the user, and what's the process name. Okay. And when was it started? How long it's been running? How many memory does it take? How many CPU uses is using currently? Okay, so yeah, a process is basically like this little bit of a bubble. It's got code that's executing, it's got memory allocated to it. It's on a user, so it's got certain permissions it can do on the system. And it's in a little sandbox and secure environment. And there's lots of stuff happening in this process. Okay. Now there's general inputs and outputs to a process. The first one is your input arguments. Now this is basically a string array of arguments. Typically, when you start a process from the command line, your arguments are separated by space characters. If you want to pass an argument, but the argument itself contains a space, you need to put quotes around it. Then, wherever the quote starts and ends, all that will be seen as one argument. And you can put spaces and all sorts of other characters in there. Okay. Um, so, for instance, if you have a command like uh, process.sh webface restart, actually we're executing process, but webface is the first parameter and restart is the second parameter. Okay, obviously your arguments actually start at zero, but um, yeah, we'll call it the first parameter. So that's your input arguments. The other input that we have is the input stream. That is a, a binary stream. So it's ones and zeros. It's not ash key. You can obviously send ash key if you want to. But it's basically a binary slash byte array stream that runs into the process. And it's always open. It's always sending. This gets sent once. As soon as it starts up, you get the input parameters. But then this technically gets closed. You don't have access to this anymore. You need to store it somewhere and use it, and that's it. 
this one here always stays open and it's a stream. So this one can be seen as it's like a hose pipe with water flowing through it. The hose pipe is plugged in and the water is flowing, always. You can, you, okay, it's not always flowing, but somebody can stop the water for a second or two and then let it flow again. But it's a pipe. Where this is more like a basket containing data that you give to the process, so that's it. So this is one transaction and it's done. Okay. Now on the other side, the outputs. There's an exit code. It's very similar to the input, but there's only one value you can return. It's always an input. And that is basically, if it is zero, let me just write that down. Usually, zero means success. And anything else is an error code. Okay, so some applications might have certain error codes, but that's application specific. So if you run, let's say, um, <coughs> a netcat command, there is a connection error. It will, let's say, return error code 5. But well, what that 5 means, you're actually going to have to go to netcat's documentation. Somewhere there, there will be a table with error codes, and you can see, okay, 5 actually means network connection error. And then you know, okay, cool, that's the problem with this. But each app is different. The only place where most of the apps agree is with success. Well, I think in Linux, all the, all the apps must have that. In Linux, all of the apps, zero is success. So if the app um, terminates safely, and everything went fine, it will return a zero. If there was some exception and it cannot continue, it will return an error code. But that's also, that's, that's not a pipe. It's not a stream. It's also like a basket with data. It just gets passed once and then it's gone. Okay. Now, another output is the two output streams. Very similar to the input stream. Obviously, instead of coming into the process, it goes out of the process. So there's always two. I think this is similar to Windows. I'm um, not sure, but I'm pretty sure Windows also have two output streams. Windows all, also use the same methodology for a process, by the way. You get arguments, input stream, output stream, exit code. Windows has the same sort of setup. Um, but the two output stream is one is your output stream, which we usually just call the output. Um, that's why if you want to print stuff in Java, you actually say system.out.println. What that actually does is it just goes to your system is your process, dot out, your output stream, dot, and you print stuff to it. So it actually sends the characters to your output stream. You actually have an error stream as well. <coughs> well some people call it the message stream. But mostly it's referred to the, as the error stream. In Java, you can say system.err. Dot print them. It will print it in the error stream. If you want to read characters, like let's say the guy types something on the keyboard, in Java you can say system.in, which is this yeah. stream. But then you read, you don't write. You see. So these are the so in Java you have those three streams available to you. System.in, system.out, system.f. Okay, those are these two streams. Uh, just keep in account that they are binary streams. Okay. The methods that we have like dot print them actually converts whatever we're printing to binary basically and prints it as binary. If you start a process from the command line, then what it basically does, it takes your keyboard and it plugs it in there. So whatever you type in your keyboard, it actually sends it into the input stream as ASCII characters. Okay. And your output and your error stream both gets joined and gets linked to your terminal. So whatever gets printed out here will be printed on your terminal. So that's why if you say system.out.hello world or system.out.println hello world, it'll actually print it on your terminal. Because these output streams and error streams are linked to your terminal. They basically merge together into one stream and then print it out. Okay. But you can actually say system.out.write um, and you can just write the byte array there, let's say it's a JPEG image. And then on the, on the co console, you'll just see gibberish. Because yeah. we'll try to translate the binary to ASCII, which is not going to be possible. So it's going to print out gibberish. But it is, it does work. You can do it. Okay. So this is the basic idea of what a process is. Obviously, inside here, there's going to be code, there's going to be threads, there's environment variables, memory allocations. And the code inside here can read stuff from there. It can access what was passed as inputs um, arguments. It can um, obviously write stuff to these streams. And obviously if it wants to terminate, it can terminate and return an exit code. 
So usually with Java, you can say, can you consistent dot exit, then you have to supply each parameter. That's this exit code here. Okay, like I said, it's exactly the same with Windows and Linux. So that's why Java, you can just return it. It's the same in Windows and Linux. You can use the yeah. same thing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Does that make sense? Oh, did something happen? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it's just a battery. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I just... Uh, I hope it's still going. Okay, so yeah, just let me know if something happens there again. Okay. Otherwise, we'll just plug a charger in. We'll use somebody else's phone. Okay. So, um... Okay, I think the next thing we'll go to is ownership. Um, processes are also actually stacked in a hierarchy, similar to folders, where um, a process always belongs to another process. So basically inside here, it's almost like small little blocks of actually other processes. Okay, but these processes, um, they don't really share each other stuff. They're still sandboxed. Okay, you can run it in the same environment and there is a method of sharing it. I haven't actually explored that much. I just usually use the input and output streams to send data back and forth. It is very controlled. Um, so the idea is that the process can actually own other processes. And then that process can own more processes. So it's this hierarchical tree. And the very topmost one is almost called your init process. So in Java, your init process is the very first one that starts. And the init process will start all the other ones. Okay. Uh, if a process gets killed, let's say I kill this one, POD2, they automatically kill all these processes as well. It can sometimes happen where you get an orphan process, where the killing instruction didn't go through to all the processes or whatever, and you get one that's running here. And I think they call it a zombie process. It's actually like orphan, it doesn't go to you. And uh, for some reason it didn't kill. So something actually went wrong with the kernel execution or the process execution. It's some, usually a very critical error. Okay. Um, obviously, every process, um, this process will be also always started by root in Linux. And then these can be started by other stuff, by let's say your user or MySQL or Apache or whatever. MySQL, for instance, has got its own user. user. It's a MySQL user. And MySQL runs as the MySQL user. Apache runs as the Apache user. Okay. So that way, there's, um, that's the difference with Windows. With Windows, there's only two users. It's admin and whoever you are. That's it. And that's why Windows, Windows has got a very big security flaw because of that design. And uh, that's why Windows gets viruses easily. But with Linux, every app basically runs in its own sandbox. So that app can be susceptible to a virus, but the only, only place the virus can actually infect is that app. It can't do anything to anybody else's files. So it can't just exploit the whole system. Okay. Where with Windows, obviously, that's a problem, but with Linux, you don't have that. So that's why it's very, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult to write the virus for Linux. It's still possible, but it's, it's a little more challenging because of that. Okay. Um, does, it make, does this make sense? Cool. I'm still going here. Yeah. Awesome. Then, um, I just want to quickly go through this. This is just executing um, processes on the command line. There's two ways of doing this. One is there's a shared executables. Okay. These are executables like cat, ifconfig, tail, jit, grep, netcat, there's a lot more. But stuff you usually type in the terminal to do stuff. Even exit. Um, I don't know what others are there. Uh, Shutdown, reboot, uh, netstat. Yeah, all those are here. They are shared variables. They're usually executable files. Each one's actually a file. But they reside in these directories. It's almost like the path variable in, in Java. Where basically if you type something, it will search these directories. And if it finds a file there, it'll execute it. And that's your executable. And if you want to execute it, you basically just type the file name. That's it. You don't type anything before it or anything after it. You just type the executable name. The other one is local folder executables. So the folder that you're currently at, you will execute that. It's not in these folders, it's like Montracon. In home Montracon, there's an executable called process.sh. And that, that you always have to put a dot forward slash in front. You can't just say the executable name. You say dot forward slash and then the executable file name. So yeah, for instance, 
pressures of SH, jet pull, jet stable, jet collect. That's why there's the two ways of using jet. One, you put the dot forward slash in front. And the other one, you just say jet, space, and whatever, whatever. If you use jet, space, pull, or jet, space, push, you're actually going straight to jet. I'm talking directly to jet. I'm using jet's functions. That's the one there. But if you say dot forward slash, use, this is actually scripts that are written that's inside the module folder. That does a lot of commands for you. So you don't have to do millions of operations just to commit and stabilize and stuff like that. So it's well. Yes, so basically we just batch file, yeah. Any, usually SH scripts has got a dot SH in there. You don't actually need that. Um, Linux actually looks at the first line of the file. If there's a hash exclamation mark, it actually means that um, this is the file you use to execute it. One of the commands here in these files is actually called SH. That's why in this SH file you'll see there's a bin slash SH, uh, this one, slash SH. What it basically does, Windows starts SH and it passes whatever file you're trying to execute, it passes as a parameter. And then it actually, the SH actually then reads the code, the Linux script and executes it. That's actually how it works. But to, yeah, to make it easier for you, they don't, you, know, you can just inside the file, you just put what file executes this. You can even write PHP scripts that way, Python scripts, Ruby scripts, um, like anything. Um, just in the first line, you tell what executable this is. And then Linux will just execute that, and pass this as a parameter, and then runs. Almost as if it's the UC, which is quite cool. OK, um, do you guys understand this? Two ways of executing. Then, um, um, we're quickly going to go through piping. Now, piping is a very, this is where Linux becomes very powerful. I don't think Windows got, has got this. But basically, what this is, is from the command line, you can uh, basically start a lot of processes, and you can connect the pipes, these inputs and output streams, to each other. So you can start a process, another process, and another process. And you can say, okay, cool, this process output stream must be linked to that process's input stream. So it starts both together and it just links it. So whatever the one will output will automatically go to the other one as input. And then you can start another one and do the same thing. Obviously the error streams um, usually just goes back to the console. I'm not actually exactly sure how to pipe the error stream to another process. I haven't actually gone that. I, I've never needed it. Because you usually the error stream is just for exceptions and messages. You never actually need to send it to another process. If it prints up the screen, it's usually fine. Um, but that's called piping. And that's where we start with our next section. And this is all console, console operations. So in your console, you can use these things to control your piping and execution. The first one is ampersand ampersand. That is if you want to execute two commands or two processes. But the second one must only run after the first one is finished. And only if the first one returns an exit code of zero. Okay. So it just makes it easier. You don't have to have all those sorts of if statements to check what was the previous one's execution, um, if it's successful or not, and only then execute the next one, etc. etc. So you can just type the one command, ampersand ampersand, another command, ampersand ampersand, another command, ampersand ampersand, another command. So the last one will only execute if all the first ones actually return exit code zero. And it will only execute one process at a time. So the first one will run until it's done, return to execute code zero, then the next one will run, until it's done, return execute code zero, and the next one will run, etc. etc. Okay, till the end. So this basically runs multiple processes in the queue. Okay, and obviously if the exit code is zero, it advances on the queue. Otherwise, if, if the execute is not zero, it just jumps out of the queue. Cool. The next one is the pipe symbol. So you can guess that's for piping. <laughs> so if you use a pipe symbol, basically you'll write a command, pipe another command. It basically says, it's basically like putting a pipe symbol there. If you put a pipe symbol there, it's this, this one, pipe that one. It means this one's output stream will be plugged into that one's input stream. And you can just carry on. This one, pipe, this one, pipe, this one, pipe, this one. And it will just sing it through. So you can like, let's say, use the cat command to print a text file to the console. Then you can use the grep command after that, so it doesn't print to the console, it actually prints it to grep. Grep then only searches for certain lines, it only prints those lines out. 
then you can pipe it to, let's say, SED, string editor, where you can do replacements. And you can replace certain words with other words. You see, so you can build all these things, and it gets really, really interesting. Just that concept makes Linux extremely powerful. Just with a couple of lines in your console, you can do really powerful stuff um, that in Windows you're going to need to download an app for. So that's one of, also one of the powerful things in Linux, is this whole piping thing. Then there's your, um, your bigger than and smaller than operators. It's similar to piping, except it sends it to files. So if you have this one, you put it after your command. So you put your command, let's say, cat, text file, or whatever. Bigger than, and then your file name. That means whatever this process outputs, that output stream, put it, store it in the file. Okay. This one is um, your error stream. You just say two, and then that one. This basically means the second stream. So that, that way you can put your error stream to a file. You can write it out to a file. This one's your input stream. So now what you can do is you can start a process, but whatever input is here, it'll actually just read it from a file and feed it in there into that process. It's a very important one. Your input stream, if that file is flushed to the process, if the file is completely flushed, it will close that input stream. And that's something that catches a lot of guys out. They get weird errors, you can't figure out what it is. It's usually that. So even if you use this, beware of that thing closing that input stream. Because a lot of apps, if the input stream is closed, the whole thing terminates. So what happens is it doesn't process everything yet. And then because the input stream closes, the app terminates. And you're like, but it didn't process all the data. It just like stopped halfway through. But it's usually because that closes. So then sometimes you need to do pipes and cats and multiple commands to get around that. Um, okay, you guys understand what this, what all these operations are? Yeah. Cool. Okay, I just did an example here of a long command. Just to, basically, I, I, I use this, this one actually quite often. If I edit something in WebPlace, but I don't want to do a full prepare, I just do want to do a quick recompile and reboot. So what I'll do is I'll use the compile script that's actually your process. Space is obviously a parameter. The parameter is this folder. So what this one will do, it'll actually compile all the Java folder, all the Java files in this folder as well, as well as all the subfolders. But this whole thing is one process. Okay, that starts. Then I use the ampersand ampersand, which obviously uses the exit code to determine if this is successful, it will do the next one. Then I again say process of SH, web face, restart. So then after that, I'll obviously restart web face. This whole thing is the second process. It's one process. That whole thing is also one process. If this is successful, it returns exit code zero. Then it will do the next one. And the next one here, what I've done, if I've just done process web face, because I print out web faces output. But then I use the pipe symbol, which is this one, which does piping. So here's actually two processes. That's one process, that's the next process. But what I'm doing is I'm taking this one's output stream and I'm plugging it into this one's input stream. And grep is basically a search. So then it will find all the lines that contains the word dev in it. And the dash EI is just another parameter to grep just to indicate that it must be case insensitive. So basically what all this does, it recompiles my source, it restarts web page, and then whatever gets output to the web page will only return the lines that contains the word data. You see, so you don't get a lot of code on your screen, you have to search for stuff you output it. So you just put the word dev colon and then whatever you want to output. That will only output those things. Okay. And yeah, I think that basically covers processes in Linux. Is there any questions? Does it make sense? Is it new to you at least some other things? Follows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do a quick example on my PC with Netcat. Okay. And then you guys can see some of the power that you actually have okay. on it.